Returning viewers to the channel may have noticed that there's been a lot of Star Wars content recently and this is mostly because Matt knows a lot about Star Wars. I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of all things Jedi so I'm getting left a bit in the dust for videos. So I thought why not try and talk about something you do know a bit about and that is Terry Pratchett and Discworld. There were three 90s point and click games and seeing how this goes maybe I'll cover all three of them, who knows. But let's start at the beginning, Discworld. If we were going to summarise the game down to one line for history's sake, all you need to know is that the game was released in 1995 on lots and lots of platforms to better than average reviews. If you're not a fan of Terry Pratchett, then that is all you need to know really. You're, you're not going to play this game, there really isn't any need to. I'm not trying to be a gatekeeper here, but unless you have some affinity with the Disc Old universe, there's nothing for you here. Just some old graphics, some jokes you'll find hit or miss told by some very familiar voices. The puzzles are too hard, the UI is creaky and there are plenty of better point and clickers to try first. Even within the same genre, Simon the Sorcerer for example, that was universally acclaimed as a top game with no entry barrier and it came into existence because Adventuresoft couldn't secure a Discworld license. On the other hand, if you are a Discworld fan then basically everything in this game is relevant to you. Although the script isn't by Pratchett, it was refined by him and given his blessing. The Story is a mashup of Guards, Guards and The Colour of Magic, with about 90% of the characters and settings being familiar. It's a bit annoying for me this amalgamation of storylines, as the Ankh Morpork Watch series of books, which Guards, Guards is the start of, are easily my favourites. Then it's The Wizards, then Moist von Litvig's 3, you know, and then the one-offs, then probably the, uh, the young adults, and then miles down the line is The Witches for me. Whatever. Either way, there is enough familiarity to keep it ticking along without actually knowing the dialogue in advance. I did mention a few seconds ago that the puzzles are too hard. There's these grumblings that modern games spoon feed you the solutions to simple tasks and I tend to agree with that sentiment, but that doesn't forgive how absolutely mentally hard some of the puzzles are in this game. If you're playing this now for the first time, just, just use a guide. You know, when you're stuck for any amount of time, just use a guide. There's no point trying to persevere. As on release, in the hardcore days of 90s DOS gaming, there was complaints that this was still taking the piss. For a comparison, and if I get this slightly wrong, I'm doing it from the top of my head, so don't complain. In Monkey Island 2, the absolute tour de force of adventure gaming for me. You have to get some money, and by that you have to get a job. I remember you get cheese squiggles, you catch a rat with them, because rats like cheese, you put that in a stew, you get served the stew, the, uh, the chef loses his job, you get the job, and you get money. Near the beginning of Discworld, you have to get an imp. There's an imp in a camera, so of course you have to get some corn to make him come out. Then you have to get a tomato to hit a tax collector in the face, which allows you to get another tomato, which falls on a mouse's head, releasing a worm from an apple. You tie the worm to some string and you use it on the whole of the camera. That's how you get one of the first solutions to, uh, to the opening puzzles. I do give credit in keeping into the anarchic wit that Terry Pratchett put into his books but it's relentless, they're all like that, everything in the game is like that. What you've also got a battle with is the, you know, unavoidable low resolution of the games of this time. That's completely fine, it is completely fine. If the designers worked within those constraints, some of the stuff is so small you can hardly, you can hardly click on it, let alone find it. On the map of the overworld, for example, two of the locations I couldn't even click on, you know, <laughs> I had to get an, an image of it as an overlay to find where I should be clicking to, uh, to get to some pretty important locations in the game. I've just said these few things now and it looks like I'm probably shitting all over the game, this is not the point. I'm getting the bad out of the way first because you know there is some real good in it, like some top, top level stuff which is yet to be beaten in even current games. One of them is the voice acting, so you've got Baldrick, you've got Young Ones Neil, you've got Crichton. I don't know how big Rob Brydon was back then when this was made, but he's basically a national treasure these days. He's voicing so many characters in this, but each one of them is still unique. A very good reason before I go into the Shades. The Shades is an area where curiosity not only kills the cat, but ties lead weights to its feet and throws it in the river. 
Although I personally don't think Eric Idle should be voicing Rincewind, what am I going to do? He gets a pass because he's he's Eric Idle and who am I? The casting of this character, Rincewind being the main protagonist in the game, is wrong. And I say this as someone who loves Eric Idle. Rincewind is a stepped upon, lucky idiot loser who should be the butt of the jokes, not the one outwitting actual men of power in some lightning fast batonage. On a personal level, what I find strange in many of the Pratchett wizard based audiobooks, Nigel Planer is the narrator, and through that, he is Rincewind in my head when I read it. Just how Stephen Briggs is my de facto Commander Vimes. And thinking about it, Nigel Planer was the wizard Mr. Sidney in the live adaptation of the Hogfather, so he definitely has the pedigree. So David Jason played both Rincewind and Albert in the TV adaptations too. So you can see and hear characters outside of what they should have been typecast as, however Eric Idle just sounds like Eric Idle in this. Christopher Lee was wanted to be death in this game, but he turned out to be too expensive to cast and you know that is a shame as there is no one better suited. I mentioned that Stephen Briggs does the, uh, the voice of Commander Vimes in the books and Commander Vimes or Samuel Vimes back when this was taking place is uh, is missing from this story and he's like my number one fictional character and he's been replaced by Rincewind. I can see the issue with the confusion of having Vimes as a cameo in a game based off one of his own books but, but that is the biggest shame personally to me. As I said right at the beginning this was released on a large number of formats. I played it on PC but you've also got it on, uh, on PlayStation. Saturn and Mac. The above average reviews that it got, I think they are fair. It's too hard and some liberties are taken with the story. But if you're a fan, it's got all the places you want to see. You've got Unseen University, The Broken Drum. You go into L Space. It's got people like the Arch Chancellor. It's got Dibbler. It's got the Librarian. It's cool, man. For a fan, it's a very good game to play. For a non fan, you know, if you like the stuff that was on the telly, you'll probably like this. If, um, if you never played, DOS gaming, you're going to be <laughs> hugely surprised with uh, with uh, with how uh, with how many colours <laughs> there isn't. Another absolutely wicked fact that I know because I read it rather than I've actually seen it is there is a fully Japanese version of this game where all the dialogue is recorded by just one dude. I love it. I love that smashing of cultures. I'm not even being snooty about it. I am fully on board. If there's one person who embodies British humour, it's Pratchett. And if there's enough of a fan base on the actual other side of the world to warrant this one geezer just to shout out all the lines in Japanese, wicked off topic but it reminds me of an episode of adam and joe where they were at a massive harry potter convention in tokyo and everyone there was just crazy into hogwarts like more so than anyone i've seen around me and i live about 20 miles away from harry potter world it's mental it just makes me so happy if anyone can point me in the direction of a japanese copy of this game i'll probably have a look at it for about five to ten minutes to have my laugh but uh thanks a lot Maybe a bit of a, a rambling off topic video here, but if you like all your old DOS gaming stuff, we've got plenty of it on the channel. If you like your old PC stuff, we've got lots of that on the channel. Whatever. Subscribe, don't. Meh. Meh. See you later.